Our first scripture reading for this evening comes from the seventh chapter of the prophet Isaiah. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as shoal or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And our second reading in our text for this evening comes from Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And it will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, now you're with me. Good. Making sure. We're going to embark on a road trip. I remember road trips when I was growing up. One especially, my family was moving from California back to Texas. Um, a couple thousand mile car journey, and this was days long, long before um, video players and DVD players and serious radio and all this stuff that you have now to distract kids in the car. Um, my parents must have planned for weeks. Um, every hour we had something different to do uh, in the car. Every day on the long of the trip, they had some place for us to stop and see. I remember one day we stopped in Las Vegas and saw Las Vegas. The next day we stopped at Grand Canyon. The next day we stopped someplace else. Every place along the way, we had something to stop and see that day. Um, again, long before the days of um, Google, where you can simply Google, what, what, can, what can I find? And it was, it was a memorable trip. I remember it. Uh, well, obviously, but I remember all the preparation my parents did. And, and that trip came back to my brain as I was thinking about this sermon series as we're doing on these Wednesday nights. As you heard, see the title called Road Trip. Um, our first road trip tonight actually starts uh, several thousand years ago. This is a, this is a road trip that began in the earliest days of the Bible. And we're going to travel down this road. And God takes us down this road to a location uh, which would be the last place on earth you would think to start. Literally the last place on earth. If, if you have a story, if you have an event, if you have something that God knows he is going to bring, something that is going to change the course of history, going to change the course of his church. It's going to change the entire, even the calendar of the entire world. You have a story that he's going to implement. You would think that he would start this story in a, maybe a city like Rome, the most important city of the era. Or maybe Athens. Athens was probably the second most important city. Or maybe Alexandria over in Egypt was an important city. If you were in a real bind, you might begin it in Jerusalem. But God begins this story 
in a city called Nazareth. Now you've got to understand, all right? Um, Nazareth is, at those days, is still a pretty small town. But Nazareth in those days was about probably 200 people. Nazareth was, Nazareth was considered a one well town. So you could have about 200 people could be fed, live off of one well living in that town. It was a village of stone and mud huts set on the side of a mountain, not even in good farm country. It's a city that people were eking out a living, struggling to make an existence. You didn't have the wealthy, you didn't have the famous living there. If you had the wealthy and the famous, they'd be living someplace else. The last place you'd want to live is be Nazareth. You can see how Nazareth was conceived and what it was thought of in John chapter 1 when one of the disciples finds out that he says, we found Jesus of Nazareth. And the guy asks, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's like saying, and I'm going to irritate some people this evening, it's like saying, can anything good come out of Dutchtown? You know, it, just that small, out of the way, no place. I ticked off somebody, sorry. <laughs> Just small, out-of-the-way nothing. But he comes to a small, out-of-the-way place, and he comes to a girl. And we're told her name is Mary. But the thing you have to stop and understand about this story is it could have been named Rebecca, because probably Rebecca lived on one side of her. It could have been named Elizabeth because Elizabeth probably lived and Elizabeth probably lived on the other side of her. There's nothing special about Mary. There's nothing special in this story. There's nothing taking place in the story. It's not significant in the story. Mary actually, in the Gospel of Luke, Mary is only mentioned one other time in the entire Gospel of Luke. And that's in the context when she doesn't get who Jesus is. She's mentioned in these birth stories in chapter 1 and 2. She's mentioned one other time when she doesn't get it. She's not the story. We get confused in this story is that we sometimes make this story about Mary. Our Catholic friends will make this story about Mary. The story's not about Mary. Make sure we understand something as it comes... And get one thing correct in here. It says in, in verse 28, it says... Uh, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now somebody, some people will say that means that Mary was special. Mary was, was ex extraordinary. That's why God came to her. Well, if you've sat in a Bible class with me, these are called, the, the verb in this sentence is called a divine passive. Now what a divine passive simply means is that it's passive to us. We're simply doing the receiving. That's the passive part. The divine part means is that God's doing the acting. So God's doing the acting, we're doing the receiving. Mary, God was the one doing the blessing. Mary was simply the one doing the receiving. Mary's just one more person in this story. History is made, more, made of her more than what Luke makes, makes of her. And it's, it's, it's echoing, in many respects, what takes place in the Bible already. Stories you know. God comes to an unknown guy in the middle of Ur, named Abram, who's a nothing. And builds a family, builds the nation of Israel out of it. God comes to the runt of a family of boys and says, you're going to be king. And David becomes king. It's, it's foreshadowing what God's going to do, what Jesus is going to do later in the Gospels when he comes to a bunch of fishermen from a place called Galilee who really were a bunch of nothings. It's God's choosing this nothing. Which makes this story, I think... If, incredible and, and, and hard to get our hands around at times because in the eyes of the world everybody in this story is insignificant 
They're, they're nothing special. They're just there. And God does that. Makes the people in this story insignificant. So that we know without a shadow of a doubt, this is God's story. This is a story that's not about Nazareth. It's not about Mary. This is a story about what God is doing. He's the one doing the giving. He's the one setting this plan in motion. He's the one who's starting the story of Jesus, continuing the story, I get my words right, continuing the story of Jesus Christ and living, beginning to exercise, to live this story out in people's lives. He's the one doing the acting. And he chooses the insignificant to carry this story out for precisely this reason so that we realize this is God's story. And he's the one doing the acting. And as we read this story and as we live this story and we make our journey of Advent, we give him the credit. We give him the credit that's due him. But see, the thing that the thing that happens in our world today, and I see this with people, lots of conversations I have, is simply this. When, when confronted with something and asked to do something or something, opportunity to share Jesus happens for, with someone, you know the drill, something happens. The thing we, I hear more times than not, I can't do this. I'm not qualified to do this. Why are you asking me to do this? Because I can't do this. I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody. Which is exactly the point. When we sit and we sit, we, we think and we feel like I can't do this, and who am, I, who am I that God chose me to share His word, to consecrate the elements? Who did God chose to share with my family member, to disciple my kids? Who did God, why did God choose me to? to share with my neighbor or live this out with my workplace why did God choose me he chose you so that he gets the credit he chose you so that when he looks on us and people look on us they see that it's God's doing the work and as important as that is when we look and we see what God is what's happening and what we're doing in the world, we realize that this is what God's doing through us, that it's not us. The story begins in the most unlikely places with the most unlikely people. So we know that as we begin this journey of Advent, it's not your journey. It's not your adventure. We're all along for the ride. For this is God's story. And he's simply bringing us along for the ride.